Hey, Slick Talkers, thank you so much for tuning into this podcast, and I know that if you love this show, you'll also love my morning show called Good Morning Hospitality with my co-hosts Michael Golden and Brandy Canale as we spend 30 minutes every Monday morning to dive into the industry's top latest news and trending topics. So go check it out on wherever you find your podcasts at Good Morning Hospitality, and you can live stream with us on Monday mornings on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and of course, YouTube. Now, I hope you enjoy this episode. So once I left the company and kind of burned the ships, I could go wherever I wanted to. And so I finally, I went to a market where the industry was booming and real estate was showing very promising signs of being worthwhile. And luckily I did make the move here and I bought five properties in the past two and a half years. You're listening to Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast, a podcast for those who are in and around the hospitality industry who love, live, and breathe what they do. You can join us for candid and unscripted conversations with hospitality experts and founders as we go deeper into their personal stories while they're sharing their triumphs and trials that got them to where they are today. I'm your host, Will Slickers, and you're listening to an episode of Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast. Now, let's begin. All right, Nathan, another minute with minute. And my question is not only am I a remote manager, but I'm not the most tech savvy. How easy is it to install a minute sensor into my property? Good question, Will. We've made the software in such a way that we hope it's really easy for almost anyone to install. If you've installed any sort of other electronic device in the past, like a Google Home or Alexa or something, then you should have no problem installing minute. From the physical installation standpoint, there's a magnetic plate with a 3M adhesive on the back. So it's literally as easy as peel and stick in most cases. You can affix it with a screw if you need to. Most of our users don't. And then as far as installing the actual device within our system, it should take you just a few minutes. And it's essentially just connecting it to Wi-Fi, giving it a name and a few other details, and you're good to go. I love it. Super simple and to the point as we like it. Another Minute with Minute, folks, and now back to the episode. All right, everybody, we are back with another episode of Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast, and I feel like it's been forever that I've recorded because I've been traveling for conferences and other things like that, but you guys wouldn't know because episodes are still going out every Wednesday, and I'm excited because for my first episode back, I get to record with Jason Reese, who I met at the STR Wealth Conference in Nashville just this last, what, was it January? March? I forget when that. I think it was the beginning of March. There we go. There we go. It feels like it was last year with how much has happened already since. But Jason, one, thank you so much for taking the time to to join me on the show. And two, I'm so excited to jump into your story. So yeah, just excited to welcome you to the show. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me on. I know you've built quite a platform and you've got a lot of respect in the industry. It was great getting to know everybody at the conference. So it's, it's great to continue the conversation. A hundred percent. Well, thank you so much. And I want to always love to jump into the beginning of your story. And I, as I got your guest form earlier today, I was kind of going through it. And, you know, a lot of us in the industry hated our jobs and wanted to get out and set financial freedom. Yours in the very beginning of your form submission and through our conversation before recording you loved your job. You actually were very building a, such a great career and ended up leaving. So I would love to know kind of where does your story really begin before jumping into this entrepreneurship side of short-term rentals and property management? Well, I think that to really define where it begins, I have to really go back to kind of the foundation of like just growing up. Right? To some degree, without telling you how the watch is made in order to tell you the time. But I think that for me, I've always had some level of exposure to entrepreneurship. And my family has a business back home. It's a construction company. My grandfather started in 1947. My grand, sorry, my uncle also has a a psychology practice. And for me, I was kind of starved of money as a kid. My parents didn't spoil me. 
So I had to figure out how to make money and either earn it through chores or selling something on Craigslist or eBay. And so I've kind of always done that, but going through college and all that, I, I really was focused on building a career, like a traditional career. And once I kind of got started when I was 22, 23 and what turned out to be the plumbing supply space straight out of yeah. college, it wasn't something I felt fulfilled doing. So I sought to do more and eventually landed in the medical device field at 26 and specifically like physiology, which is the study and treatment of abnormal heart rhythms. So I started with Johnson as, as a 26 year old in Chicago and the field I just found completely mesmerizing. I mean, it was super challenging. It's very cerebral. And with that kind of cerebral puzzle that you have to kind of figure out during your procedures, the reward is immensely satisfying. So I go through my career and I build this career out better than I could ever have hoped for. And I found myself in a place where I felt extremely fortunate. I remember having multiple moments where I really reflected and felt appreciative of what I had because I felt like a lot of people just did not have that type of fulfillment mm -hmm. through a career. And so it was financially rewarding. It was say personally rewarding. It was intellectually rewarding. So if you do your job well, then you ultimately get rewarded with more procedures and business with physicians. And that ultimately helps pay the bills. And once I moved from a clinical role, uh, from 3d mapping and treatment of abnormal heart rhythms, I moved into a sales role. And as I started moving further away from the patient, I knew that my sense of reward was, would diminish a bit, uh, or at least that's what I expected. And so as I got into the sales role, I really enjoyed that still, but it wasn't quite as exciting as the clinical aspect. And so eventually once I finished with the sales role, I moved into a marketing role in house. And I think it's important to say that I never wanted to do any of the roles that I did. Like when I was going through college and when I graduated college, I never wanted to be in anything medical and I never wanted to be in anything corporate. And I didn't want to be a salesperson because I don't trust salespeople. <laughs> and, and so there was a big lesson as I was moving through my career, like, okay, well, maybe I'm not as smart as I think I am. Maybe I don't know myself as well as I think I do. And sure as hell don't know these other, these opportunities out there in the world, as well as I think I do casting a, a blanket stereotype on all sales roles and all clinical roles. And so carrying that perspective into the marketing role, never wanted to be in corporate because I just don't really care for the cookie cutter suit and tie environment, but I absolutely enjoyed the marketing role. The downside for me began, the cracks began to form in that marketing role once I got it, the cracks began to form once I uh, really started to experience burnout in that second year in that role. So I joined the team and I was very fortunate to have some very high profile projects. I managed the 3D mapping software portfolio for the US and we had some key and strategic initiatives that were launching as I was stepping into the role, which fell squarely on my shoulders and essentially only my shoulders as soon as I walked out the door. And so I had these running in parallel. I was bringing some, another technology over from Europe, launching it over here in the U S in a very tightly regulated, call it FDA environment. And it created a, a great opportunity for me to build a foundation in the corporate side of our business and get some great exposure. But with that came a lot of stress. And while I had success in those roles, I. I never got the sense that I had accomplished a lot because everything ran in parallel with each other. Like every project, if I was doing one or two high profile projects, high stress projects, sometimes maybe three at a time. And then as soon as one ended, I was already working on two or three others. And so I never really got a chance to like stop, look around, see what I've accomplished, have a sense of accomplishment and, yes. and let the stress kind of wash away. Never ha really had that. And so eventually I got pretty burnt out to the point where I had heaviness in my chest and like shortness of breath, which is all odd for me. I'm typically a very hard worker and I stayed for dinner at the office almost 
every night. Mm. And, but I enjoyed it. I stayed because I really wanted to do what I was doing. And I wanted, I knew how every, because I came up through the business, I knew how everything I was doing impacted the business. And so eventually I had the opportunity to, to reevaluate my career. And a buddy of mine who quit his career prior kind of led me towards that, that, that idea. And from that perspective, I didn't see anything looking forward that really appealed to me anymore. Like the next corporate role was a, a global role and I didn't feel like that was going to be appealing to me or rewarding for me at that time. And I couldn't see myself in the corporate hamster wheel much longer because I wasn't going to survive. And so anyways, I ended up leaving. I took a, it was a big hard right on my career path and it shocked everybody. Like there, it was very much not expected, which it makes sense because I didn't expect it either, but I felt like I was at a fork in the road and it was now my time to, to try my hand at entrepreneurship, which had been on my mind for 10, 15 years. I kind of always knew that I would probably start something on my own at some point, but I didn't know when. And I sure as hell didn't expect it to be that year. Yeah. Uh, but, was, oh. Go ahead. What year was that for you? 2019. 2019. Yeah. And when you took that hard right, where did you end up going? Did you take just a break? Did you immediately jump into short-term rentals? Where was Jason headed during that hard shift? Well, physically, I headed to Europe for about three months. My buddy and I, the buddy that kind of led me down this path, he and I went over there for an indefinite amount of time. We're like, maybe we'll continue just going around the world. We didn't really know where that whole journey was going to take us in a lot of different ways. And, but after a few months, I came back to the U.S. And that's where I started spending time really diving deep into what my path was going to be. And normally I would, I would have many more steps ahead planned out before taking this step, at least mm -hmm. two or three to know exactly where these stepping stones were going to lead me, at least at an early trajectory, I would know where I was going to head. But in this case, I didn't do that. And I think in part, I did it that way because I knew that for one, I was never really, I learned that I'm not going to be able to make as good a decision as I think I am until I'm in that position. Because previously in my career where I didn't want to do those other roles, right? I didn't want to be in sales. I didn't want to be in medical. I didn't want to be in corporate. But then I learned that once I got close to those roles, they were actually really appealing and I could see a different perspective or from a different perspective. So anyways, I get, I put myself in the position of leaving my career. So I more or less could burn the ships and whatever I do, I had, I was committed. And so I look at drop shipping and e-commerce for a while. I felt like I could do that well, still feel that way. But ultimately I didn't feel like it was going to be a very rewarding venture for me. And one of the big things with drop shipping is you find a product that A is going to be worthwhile. But for me, it was find a product that I was interested in actually selling. I don't want to sell them. nail clippers, right? Or yeah. some of these other random miscellaneous items. And the things that I did want to maybe get behind and, and try to pedal, you know, ultimately I had become saturated pretty quickly. So that's where I really started to lean into Airbnb and when I decided to move to Nashville, it made a lot of sense for me because this was a market that I was willing to invest in. So I, I left Arkansas at the time and decided to, to research four different markets uh, for me to start my uh, Airbnb kind of pursuit. And I looked at Nashville, Austin, Texas, Dallas, Texas, and Chattanooga here where I have family and I built a, a document that allowed me to do an apples to apples comparison of each market. And ultimately Dallas had the best numbers, frankly, Austin was completely just swamped with regulation and 
Nashville seemed like it was on the early stages of an Austin like trajectory from a real estate standpoint. And it was also close to close to her family. So that's ultimately how I ended up landing here in Nashville and pursued Airbnb because it was an intersection of investing and design and technology and problem solving and hospitality, all things that, you know, are close to me. Yeah. How did you first get exposed to Airbnb and short-term rentals and the shared economy? Because to go from drop shipping as an idea or concept to play with then to short-term rentals, was there a specific ad on TV, a radio ad, a, a YouTube channel or anything in particular where you were like, oh, that actually makes a lot more sense and it's something like looks like a lot of fun compared to, because most people I feel like wouldn't immediately know what to do like you did and like, all right, I'm going to look at these markets that I'm interested in to invest in and to operate. It's more like you, you got to get given a property or whatever the scenario might be and then you start running with it. Right. So where was your, that first exposure for you? That's a good question. I don't think I've ever really thought about that. I think it, it was a slow drip over a long period of time. So I have actually looked at Airbnb for probably five years and just considered it in the back of my head, but I never pursued it because my career was moving at such a speed that I was relocating every, it seemed like two years. And yeah. so I could never really take the time to invest in real estate. And then of course, try to manage that real estate. So once I left the company and kind of burned the ships, I could go wherever I wanted to. And so I finally, I went to a market where the industry was booming and real estate was showing very promising signs of being worthwhile. And luckily I did make the move here and I bought the five properties in the past two and a half years. Yeah. So let's actually walk through that. One, I have two kind of directions I want to take this with you. One is the property, the five properties in two years. It's incredibly fascinating to me. I've never actually fully bought my own properties yet, but hearing the amount that you've gone through is pretty, two years is a short period of time to have that much purchasing happen, big purchases happening. And then two, you know, I've gotten to talk about short-term rental tech, AI, certain things around that. And I love that in your bio that you sent over, you've gotten to the point where you're able to really have about one hour of active management a week. A lot of people hear that and or use that type of phrase as a buy my course tactic or marketing plan or whatever it is. But I think the way you phrased it as active management versus I only spend one hour a week on my business and you can too, is that you are actively managing the properties, but then the rest of your time is spending, I'm assuming on new deals, expansion, refining processes, X, Y, and Z. So it's not just one hour and then you're on the beach the rest of the time. Mm -hmm. It's one hour of active, okay, responding to guest stuff, doing all the back end stuff, but then the rest of your time is focused on growth. So I'd love to jump into the five properties in two years piece first. What, like, I, I guess what helped you, especially quitting your job, go into that route of being able to afford it, to figure out where to buy, how to invest and knowing what does drive an ROI. Cause I think there's a lot of power in ownership versus management. So I'd love to kind of get your perspective on the properties and that, that whole process over the last two years. Yeah. So I think first off, I'm fairly risk averse or at least was more so than I am now, strictly because I understand now that you know, if I take a little bit of risk, there's a bit more reward and all, and also again, I don't know everything. So I've learned that just get to the point where, you know, 80% of the things, cause you're never going to know hundred percent, you're never going to feel comfortable doing your first deal. I still don't feel comfortable signing paperwork, buying a property. Every yeah. single one of my properties that I've bought, I've been a little bit nauseous and <laughs> a bit uneasy every time. And I'm like, I don't know if this is going to work, even though yeah. I'm running numbers like to the T looking at it five different ways. And I know I can answer everybody's questions and then turn around and teach them 
something about the question they just asked me. So like, yeah, at that point, I still don't feel comfortable. And so that's the reason I share that is because I think that a lot of people are waiting for that sense of comfort. And I think you really just have to understand that it's not going to come. If you're extremely comfortable doing it and you haven't really done this before, then chances are you're either very brave or very naive. <laughs> either way, it can work out. But the point is that in general, just don't require comfort as a prereq to getting started. So my first deal that I bought was kind of the first execution of a strategy, a portfolio strategy. So I didn't want to compete with hotels. I know big groups like Saunders going by, going around buying hundreds and thousands of doors and then Marriott and a lot of the big hotel players, they're trying to get into the home sharing program as well. And they were making some changes to some of their floor plans, even to accommodate multiple rooms, et cetera. So I wanted to make sure that my properties would be, call it invincible against a massive scale player, like any of those. And so I wanted to focus on unique properties. And so the first property I bought, I walked in the brick building built in 1865 the year the civil war ended and I get up to the unit and it's a beautiful exposed brick, arched brick windows, 15 foot vaulted ceilings with massive wood beams and gnarly rust, rusted hardware. You're showering under a 15 foot vaulted ceiling, wooden ceiling, mm. just a really cool space. They're recently renovated. I'm like, yeah, this is going to be my spot. And so I put in an offer. This was during the pandemic at the time. The previous owners started their Airbnb foray with that property and it went live like two months prior to the pandemic. And mm -hmm. so they really got smacked in the mouth, right? And so they're like, mm -hmm. okay, we're out of state investors in California. So we don't like what just happened and we're getting killed. So yeah. we're going so to get out. So I got in and that started my first. Air, I started my Airbnb journey in October of 2020. That property at the time I was expecting to do 90,000 a year. And last year it did 114. Wow. And to your point about the ownership piece, this one property, if I did not buy this property, all I would have made was about half of that 114. Mm -hmm. But instead. That property now has doubled in value. I paid 550 a foot for it. And now there's comps for around $1,100 a foot in that property. And so I put wow. down $61,000 to buy that first property. I was very nervous when I did it. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. All I've done yeah. is research and watch a bunch of YouTube videos on how to do everything that I was trying to do, but I still wasn't comfortable. And that $61,000 now would be worth almost $500,000 Jeez! In, in about two years. Yeah. Yeah. And so so wow. that's the beauty of buying the property. And that's just the mm -hmm. surface level piece. That's not going into the tax strategy, which I leveraged cost seg study, cost segregation study this past year, but we can go to that rabbit hole later. Soon after that. Several months after that, I bought my second property. And this one is a downtown loft. It's in the best zoning that you can find in Nashville. And it's walkable to Broadway, which is it's the biggest attraction yep. to Nashville that we have. And so it's a few blocks away from Nash or Broadway. And there's a spiral staircase going up to a lofted bedroom. And I immediately saw that and thought, hey, this is unique. And I knew somebody there that had some real numbers in a similar floor plan. And I like those numbers. So I bought that place immediately and that is now my number one property and I bought that one for 400, put about 75 in for renovation and furnish and design. And the last year at growth about 140,000 as wow. a two bedroom. And so from there, I sold a property in South Carolina, held an empty lot. 
and 1031 proceeds from that sale into my third property here. That was what, June? And that was in June of last year. And then bought another one in September, built this house, moved into it actually last February and got my fourth Airbnb up and running and the fifth that I manage in August and September by the end of the last year. So now that you have one under management, what's, do you still prefer ownership or do you have like pros and cons for what you like to own versus what you like to manage? Yeah, 100%. I would 100% rather own than manage. Luckily, my one client is my dad. And so <laughs> he's, he doesn't Makes require, he doesn't require a ton, <laughs> even though I try to like create these reports and send them to him. He's like, he's like listen, okay. he's like, listen. He's like, listen, I didn't get into this for, to make this a business deal. I did it, uh, to work with you basically. He's like, it's everything's cool. fine. So the reality is that the money that comes from that is drastically, I mean, I, I think when you own versus when you manage, like managing, you're getting maybe 20% in general, at least in my experience so far, 20% of the overall value of your efforts and when you own you're doing the same amount of work but you're literally getting not just the tip of the iceberg you're getting everything that's under the water surface it's there's so much more there and so i've looked at some arbitrage opportunities just to diversify and also get some experience there and and try to learn what i don't know going back to what we talked about earlier because there's, I'm sure there's plenty there that I just don't know. And there's benefits maybe by running the arbitrage model that I'm not familiar with, just by being on the side. But at this time, if I have one unit of effort, I want to maximize the return on that unit of effort. And arbitrage just inherently doesn't do that. All right, Slick Talkers. Now for another dynamic sponsored duo of the podcast. I would love to introduce you to Vintory and Safely. About Vintory, we've had Brooke Fotts on the podcast, who is a founder, multiple times, and him and his team know numbers. They know data and they know marketing. They know how to help property managers just like you scale and grow their business by adding more inventory, aka more homes, into your rental program that drive the bottom line. For all of you listeners that want to learn how to scale and grow your inventory, you can get a free digital copy of Brooke's book called From Zero to 500 Properties in Five Years. And for an added bonus, if you would do a demo of the Vintory platform, you'll get a $50 gift card to Amazon. Now that's a sick deal. And now to touch on our friends at Safely.com. Safely.com helps property managers just like you and I protecting the homes that they manage from structural damage to content damage and of course bodily injury. This means plates, linens, cups, couches, tables, curtains, walls, and of course your guests themselves are protected. And this helps you by scaling your company in order to ensure that you are retaining owners and inventory in your program. If anything is broken or if anyone is hurt, you are able to make a claim through Safely and within three business days you can get in instantly paid out to replace any items and settle any claims that happen on site without having to deduct from your owner's payouts. That's why I call these guys the dynamic sponsor duo. And thank you so much for tuning into the podcast. Check out their offers in the show notes and back to the episode. Yeah, I agree with you on there. I'm not a big arbitrage fan, but I am very curious how you set yourself up as an owner and a manager for creating this because what it sounds like you're obviously you got to be doing some kind of type of dynamic pricing i'm assuming for the numbers you're getting versus what you're expecting to then i'm sure access control is a big piece monitoring the properties from either noise or maybe some kind of outside camera what's your overall tech stack look like and how have you built that out over time with your properties and their uniqueness and floor plans and locations and all that other stuff yeah so the the softwares that I typically use, I've added a little bit over time, including some AI lately. But to begin, the first thing I did was start using price labs. I needed to automate the pricing. There's way too many variables in, in this market, especially, that drive demand up and down. If you're in a very small market, 
then I could understand maybe wanting to manage it yourself or feeling mm -hmm. like that is manageable. But for me, again, there's so many variables there and you have to, you have to understand that you don't know everything. And as much as you think you can like figure it all out, maybe you can, that's, but is it worth it? Is the time yeah, right. and effort and energy and focus worth it to, to have to stay on top of it? So price labs, dynamic pricing is the number one thing that I have used and still use and recommend that everybody use beyond that. I, with only two properties, I believe it was, I started using hospitable and I didn't really need, didn't really need that at the time, but I knew that I was, my strategy was the scale. And I knew that I planned out that I needed four properties within two years to offset my career income. And so, because I knew where I was going, I went ahead and just started using those softwares that allow me to scale faster. And so mm -hmm. I started using some of the scheduled messages before I ever really needed them just to get myself comfortable with it so that as I was growing, I could easily just onboard other properties with the scheduled messages. Like, thanks for booking and yeah. three days prior, here are some details that will make your trip coming to Nashville easier and then check out messages and all these automated things that allow me to be pretty yeah. hands off. I get messages all the time from guests that They'll send you a message saying, thank you, Jason. I'm like, I do. like I'm playing volleyball right now. It's like, I, I <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're like, thank you so much. You've been so helpful. Like I hadn't done a thing except put something yeah. on a schedule. <clears throat> and beyond that, I use rank breeze to try and kind of discern some sort of understanding of the algorithm and search into not some SEO search into optimization of Airbnb's algorithm. But honestly. Rank Breeze is, it's interesting to see how your property can ebb and flow from the bottom of the ranks to the top of the ranks for no apparent reason whatsoever. And then tank again. I think my takeaway has been that uh, you, you really just can't master. You, there's some things that you can do, some universal things that just are common sense. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in general, you're not going to be able to just hack the algorithm as a lot of people like to broadcast the market. Yeah. So that one's been kind of interesting. I still do some A-B testing and you can track that on Rank Breeze, but in general, I haven't found anything to immensely, very clearly uh, correlate to, to something I'm doing. And I think the most recent thing that I've started using from an AI standpoint, which there's kind of a catch now, unfortunately, but Guest Guru has been like an absolute amazing tool. So guest guru is essentially it's, it's harnessing the power of large language models that have been popularized through chat GPT or similar. Mm -hmm. And so when guests send a message to you, currently we have these proactive messages, right? These scheduled ones that are like 90% of the automation is, or 90% of the messages are automated. But those are all proactive on our side. But if a guest responds back and asks a question or says something, like we have to manually respond. So that's the other half of the coin that we're still trying to, or have still been trying to, to solve for. And AI now has provided us the technology to, to do that. And Guest Puru was the first one to jump on that, jump on that bandwagon and build a tool that has turned out to be extremely useful. I've been involved with them for probably three months and am now an advisor with that company, but they're around to growing some changes at the moment. But I will say that in the future, when Guest Guru resurface, resurfaces, I urge everybody to try and track down that tool and make use of it because it's become an integral part of my operation. So the way Guest Guru works is a guest sends a message and get through, we'll intercept it, put it into a text message format and send it on to your phone directly. And so I have my properties will live, they live directly in my iMessages on my iPhone. And so I have them pinned at the top. So each property has a, a thumbnail and all my conversations per property stay within their own little contact thread. Right. And so 
the message gets intercepted by guest guru. They forward it to you in a text message, but then they also forward to you or send you a suggested reply that the AI has generated for you. And the response is easily sent with just a few letters. So if you want to approve that message, you get to read the draft that guest guru has put together for you. And then you get to approve or deny the message to be sent with just a few keystrokes. And if a guest sends you a message with two or three questions, yes, on multiple occasions, guest group has acknowledged their question or acknowledged their questions, recited them, and then addressed each and every one all the way to the bottom and then wished them a great time in Nashville and let me know if you have any other needs. And I've been extremely impressed at how that technology within Guest Guru specifically has progressed over the last few months. They are currently, sounds like they might be getting bought. So I guess we'll have to see where they land and who absorbs them because I think it, yeah. it will be interesting to, to try to figure out how to tap into that under which platform it may be. Yeah. I'm sure. Well, I'm kind of curious because you and I actually connected. We met with Tom at Nashville and who's part of Guest Guru. And uh, I got connected with him shortly before Nashville, I think maybe like a month or two before. Great, great concept. And I love hearing the amount of changes that have gone through. But I'm curious from your perspective, a lot of the podcast audience or listeners of this show are traditional or bigger vacation rental management companies that have brands and local teams and other things like that. What's your thought on this as you're building out a portfolio of properties in Nashville? Do you see yourself creating like a hospitality brand or is this a real estate kind of play for you? I'm kind of curious on what your thoughts are on that being on multiple channels outside of Airbnb and building out a kind of a company logo, not like a logo, but you know, say like a hospitality, like Jason Reese hospitality. I don't know, but something like that in the sense of just being a host versus like an actual company brand for guests and travelers. Yeah. So I'm on the front end of that now. So. That's more of, I think my vision is more of building out a, a hospitality brand for travelers, not necessarily, not necessarily catering to, to, I'm not trying to build a hosting brand where other hosts come to me and we work together. I mean, I, I do a little bit of that now just through consulting, but beyond that, my main focus at the moment is what I kind of consider is legitimizing my business. And so I will, I'm starting this year my direct booking site. So, you know, I'm going to work with Boost League on that. Just had a call with them last week. And so once I get that going, that's when the branding of my business will take shape. And so I kind of envision there's a company called a Brandywine. It's like a, it's kind of an outdoor escapes kind of really cool custom ground up construction, kind of a really cool cabins. And they built a pretty cool brand on Instagram that you can look them up. It's called Brandywine. And so I'd like to do something like that for my portfolio of properties. And ultimately there may be an umbrella and I have some in the city and then I do some that are more rural and kind of mm -hmm. split the brands, but that's the vision at the moment. I love that. I'm always just curious because it's so different coming from, and I hate saying this like two different sides of the industry, but you know, coming from the hospitality world to then getting exposed to more of the people who have just started by hosting or buying property and just figuring it out, building up. It's always very interesting on the perspective. So it's cool to hear your kind of mindset around that. Yeah. And just, I think that, yeah. I think too, that the, at this point I've got, I think it's almost 400 reviews at 4.97 stars. And so what I have learned is that it's not easy to do that. There's not a lot of, there's, I think the average on Airbnb across their entire database is 4.8 as a rating. And in Nashville, based on the numbers that I pulled, I scrubbed like a, a spreadsheet of like 5,000 or 10,000 listings and the average is like 4.81. And so for me, I feel like there is quality there that could easily be branded and people not only feel like they get quality with the branding and the experience I've established on the front end, but also that it's going to follow through throughout the duration of their trip. And, and so my brand becomes synonymous with 
quality and knowing what to expect, what they, people get from hotels, which is one of the reasons why some still go with hotels because they know what they're going to expect. There's less variables. Yeah, totally agree. I love this whole conversation around the beginning part of your story. I kind of want to maybe before we end up wrapping up the episode, it took a lot of, I would say, courage and self-reflection. Definitely, uh, yeah, self-reflection or self-awareness, if you want to put those two together for you to make this leap into quitting and taking this hard right and just going into this industry. And as you've been saying, burning the ships, which I love that book. It's a great book if anyone's ever read it. And what would you say has been trying to figure out the right wording for this, but the biggest inspiration or was it just a gut feeling that you just knew you had to do this or else it was never going to happen? Or was there outside of the buddy that you went to Europe with, where did that really come from deep within? Like, I, I know you've been exposed to entrepreneurship in your early childhood days. So was there something from that kind of growing up experience that really helped push you forward or where would you say that really came from? I think that because I've been exposed to entrepreneurship and I sort of had that as a kid, that motivated me to look deep inside to, to really ask the question of, do I ignore this itch any longer? And what I found with that really turned out to be pretty, pretty deep going through that conversation with myself. And because I was on this well-established career path and I felt like I was in this really great space or place from a professional standpoint and I had great relationships and reputation and all these things that I was proud of. And did I really want to rock the boat? Or was it really worth changing up yeah. everything? The reality was, is that while I really fell in love with my career in those first several years, it had changed a bit in recent years. And so I kind of went back to the drawing board of my life and I was like, okay, let's go back to the basics. Let's go like really go back to like the foundation of my time on this earth and how I want to spend it. Like if I'm going to build out a life, what is it going to look like? It's not going to look like what it currently is. That part I knew. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to work until 7, 8 p.m. most nights during the week and feel like I'm under an immense amount of stress most days of the week. That just isn't what I wanted. So I knew that. But I did also didn't know, it was like, is now really the time to, to pursue this? So I had the idea to talk to people who are older, wiser than me and to get their advice. But that kind of, I don't know, that kind of shifted into or grew into this idea of talking to people whose time has run out. Like yeah. Talking to people who are on their deathbeds say at a nursing home where they literally go there to die and they, mm -hmm. and a lot of them are aware of this fact. And so we tend to think of our lives on this timeline where, you know, most of our life is ahead of us. So we're like, we have all these ambitions and all these plans and like, maybe I can do this, then I can do that. And then this, and then maybe I'll get married and then maybe I'll have kids and then maybe I'll have this business and I'll make X amount and then I'll do this and that. So you have all this time to fit in all these things. But what happens if you think about that the other way around, where you're at the end of that line and the life that you're given is over mm -hmm. and you have to have like a really honest, I think, emotional introspection to, to do this, I think, the right way. Because if you don't evoke some kind of emotion, like thinking about it, like even just getting chills or like feeling like it's a heavy subject, then you're probably not doing it right because we only get one life, right? And if we are on our deathbed or in the place that we know we're going to have our last breaths and we're able to talk to ourselves and say, wow, that was it. 
that was my, that was the hand I was dealt. And that's the hand that I played. I want to be able to look at that in retrospect and know that I left it all on the table. I did the things that I wanted to do, the things that compelled me to do them so that when I die, I can truly rest in peace. I don't want to feel like I missed out because I was scared to do something because I was uncomfortable. And so that, that conversation with myself led me to, I didn't have to go to the nursing home to interview these people because I knew what the answers would be. And it's pursue what it is that you want to pursue. And at the end of the day, if it didn't work out, if I failed, first off, who cares? Second off, if it didn't work out and I went back to my old line of work, this experiment is just a blip yeah. on the timeline. So the fact that you like, or that we want to try and make an argument for not doing something that takes up maybe one to 2% of your life's timeline. And you think that's enough reason to never find out a lot of people think that way. And I mean, I did for a while. But, you know, a lot of people are scared to take the risk and to fail. But instead of asking what happens if I try and fail, ask what happens if I try and I don't. And so when you think about life and some of those things in those different perspectives, I think that it can really help put things in perspective for people. If there's something, whether it be Airbnb or some other venture that they just have interest in. I mean, I just encourage everybody to really put things into perspective and, and prioritize and ultimately execute. Yeah. I love it. And it kind of perfectly segues into the final part of the episode where I kind of told you that every episode before we ask the guest of that episode to ask the next guest a question without knowing who they are. And your guest before you was Jonathan Wicks with well and good over in Arizona and his question I would love to hear your answer around is describing a moment with someone that you work with closely it could be a coworker, a colleague uh, employee anybody in your vicinity a, ven a vendor even that you had with them that was this is what makes it worth a moment it could be very short it could be very long if you've had a moment where that big risk, that big leap, and you finally got to have and experience that, what was that moment for you? Do you want it to pertain to this new venture or could it be career? Anywhere. Oh, I think that the number one thing for me that was you know, really kind of the highlight of my career for me, like walking away from it through my career. I had fortunately some of some good success there. We were number one multiple times. I have some records broken, uh, multiple awards that are still sitting here. There are ideas that I've brought to the company that have been implemented that are, is now, I mean, multiple things are now used widely throughout the company, but also customers are buying them. The majority of the customer base is buying them or previously they didn't, but they did. They are now that I made some changes to, to certain things. All that's rewarding, even bringing technology over to the U S and it being standard of care now. And I was responsible for, for bringing that to the market and getting that launched. None of that really matters to me outside of those, like one conversation that I had with a customer when my manager was in town, actually, as a, when I was probably halfway through my career. And so he, this guy was a, he was a veteran in the healthcare industry. He's had multiple positions. He was a CEO at one point. At this point, he had gone back and was managing the whole cath lab department. And he was telling my manager some complimentary things about me. And this guy, Southern fellow, a little bit hard nosed and he was telling my manager at the time that he can count on his five fingers, the number of reps that he trusted. 
And he took his time to outline very specific reasons why he trusted me, why I was a partner for them. I wasn't just there to get a paycheck. I was helping them problem solve. I was a key piece of their operation. All these things that ultimately led to him trusting me more than 99% of the reps that he had dealt with, 99% of the salespeople he had dealt with over his uh, 40 plus year career. And to me, that was extremely impactful because hmm. like I said, I never wanted to be in sales because I don't trust salespeople. So when I was in sales, I was like, I'm not going to be a typical salesperson or I, yeah. I'm going to lead with trust. I'm going to lead with doing things the right way. And sometimes that was, I don't want to say it was hard to do, but sometimes what the customer needs isn't what the company wants the customer to buy. Mm -hmm. And so I, on a regular basis, side with the customer, position myself alongside them. You either need it or you don't. And I just trusted that in time, I was building a long-term business and reputation there. And ultimately that would pay off and it did. And for me, that was a very rewarding moment because it was validating in the way that I decided to operate as a sales rep. And mm -hmm. it's not a, anything I've put on my, my wall or stand on stage and talk about, but it's something that I personally have found a lot of a value in. I love it. If you had one question for the next guest without knowing who they are, what would it be? I think that since my mind is in this kind of deeper existential kind of path right now, I would say that I would ask them if they are on their deathbed, what is it that they will have wanted to do or will have wanted to accomplish? And are they on that path? That's going to be a fun one. That's going to be a fun one for sure. Yeah, I love that. I love it. So, super good. And it definitely, I'm sure anyone listening will be probably thinking about that as well. I really enjoyed this episode. I'm curious if anyone wants to reach out to you in the sense of following your stuff or just getting connect and to hear more of your story, what link or what place would you send them? Um, primarily Instagram. So I'm there as at JW Reese. So it's J-W-R-E-C-E. -E. I'm posting more and more there now. And so you should see more content from me. But I have a little bit there from AI or on AI. That has been pretty interesting. And I've got some more content coming out around that. But also I do some consulting for various stages of your Airbnb or real estate journey. And so I've got a link in my bio for, for various things. And so you can find me there if you want to book some time or shoot me a message. I love it. Well, you heard it here first, Slick Talkers. Make sure you like and subscribe everything Jason Reese. And of course, like always, we'll see you guys again next week. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you to our show partners for making Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast possible. We hope you enjoy the show and we would love to connect with you outside of the podcast. So you can follow us on all of our social media channels for daily hospitality content or find us on slicktalkthepodcast.com. And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. I'm your host, Will Slickers, and we will see you guys all again next week.